Our second speaker this evening is David Coburn. David is the leader of Scottish UKIP and an MEP for the Scotland constituency and has been since 2014. David, the floor is yours. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honoured to be here at the alma mater of those great Englishmen, Philby, Burgess and McLean. And I would like to say that I'm a great fan of England. I've spent many of my years, formative years here um, at university in Leeds. And uh, I love England as much as I love Scotland. So I'd just like to make that clear. The tide of public opinion in Scotland is turning. The last general election showed us that the SNP were not as popular as they thought they were. Scotland's separation from the United Kingdom seems to be the SNP's only policy, and Scots have found it wanting. The SNP have destroyed one of the finest education systems in the world. Oh, I'm losing my phone. Uh, they have damaged the Scottish economy by creating uncertainty about Scotland's direction as a nation. Don't you, think, <laughs> don't you think that the real damage being done to Scotland's economy, and indeed the whole of the United Kingdom's economy at present, is by the uncertainty that those of your ilk have caused by procuring the Brexit vote? No, because the majority of people voted to leave the European Union. And we voted as a United Kingdom and not as Scotland. And when Scotland voted uh, for independ if against independence, they also at the same time knew there was a forthcoming vote on the European Union, and they voted nonetheless in favour of the Union. More people voted for the Union than voted for the other. Anyway, the SNP have destroyed one of the finest education systems. Well, they've damaged... I, can tell I these people. And you can then would you like them? to tell people the evidential basis for saying the SNP have destroyed the educational system in Scotland? What's your evidence for that, Mr. Coburn? Well, their latest ideas are not the ones I would uh, approve of. They don't believe in competition. They don't believe in reading, writing, and arithmetic. All they're interested in is is character building and 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 odd sort of uh, weird ideas that have nothing to do with teaching children to read, write, and add up. Quite frankly, that's what people want their children to be able to do. Well, the uncertainty of our direction as a nation and also the nature of Scotland's currency. This is doing tremendous damage to any form of investment in Scotland. It's catastrophic. Despite calling themselves Scottish nationalists, the Scottish nationalists are nothing of the sort. I am a Scottish patriot, which means I could never be a Scottish nationalist. Scotland's best interests lie in a 300-year-old alliance with the rest of the United Kingdom. Scotland's alliance with England enabled both nations to punch above their respective weights. Both nations were insignificant in, in many ways in the world before the Union, and after, thereafter, Great Britain took the rule of law and democracy to the furthest corners of the globe. Neither Scotland nor England could ever have done this on their own. England is Scotland's biggest market. 60% or more of our exports go there. It's our biggest customer and the largest opportunity for Scots to find jobs south of the border. And I can tell you, I was one of them. When Scotland had no jobs in the 70s, I went south like many of my schoolmates. So Scotland, England is a great opportunity for Scots who then go home and start businesses. The SNP's constant baiting of England to achieve their independence fetish has severely damaged our relationship and the Scottish business. Jobs have been lost. Scots are not as well thought of in the South as they used to be. And no wonder with the SNP's behaviour. This was not the reason the Scottish Parliament was created. The Parliament was created to fill a perceived democratic deficit. Secretaries of State for Scotland were perceived to be less democratic, uh, and of course they were. 
too often they were seen as viceroys. Holyrood was created with a view to working in harmony with the Westminster Parliament, but the Scottish nationalists have simply used it as a battering ram to achieve their goal of independence. This has created a major, let me be, oh, well, sorry, fine, fine. Would you have said, is it all, uh, do you support the actual creation of the Holyrood Parliament, or is it all just the SNP's fault for um, uh, using it as this um, uh, battering ram to do all these nasty things? I'm coming to that. <laughs> this has created a major constitutional problem, which was never intended when the Scottish Parliament was re reconvened after an advent, uh, absence of a couple of hundred years. Scott, sick of SNP mis misrule, threw out several of the SNP's biggest beasts at the last general election. Angus Robertson, Alex Salmon, and my honorable opponent, uh, Tasmina. This is a sign that the Scottish political tide is turning. And when the tide went out in the northeast of Scotland, the Scottish National Party's big beasts were perceived to be not wearing any bathing costumes. They are, but despite their braggadocio, the Scots, the Scots separation, or about Scots' preferred wit of separation to sound economics, jobs, and education, the Scottish nationalist leadership got their P45s from the Scots who had previously received theirs. Thank you, Mina. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I understand that the uh, Honourable Gentleman is leader of the United Kingdom International Party in Scotland. Can uh, I ask more members? Independence Party. Yes. Can I ask how many seats your party won in the election in Scotland? <laughs> Well, I can tell you, it's the same thing happened with the Liberal Democrats. What happened was that people voted to make sure... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a pound on the room. Can I, can I just, uh, let me just finish with Kazuna, I'm happy to say. Um, we, basically, people wanted to make sure the Scottish nationalists lost their majority. They wanted the Scot Nats out. So they voted strategically to get them out. And a lot of votes, which might have come to my party, went to the Conservatives. The and I quite understand that. I mean, how many seats then did UKIP win in the previous Scottish election, or indeed the previous general election, or the Scottish parliamentary election before that? <laughs> well, as I said before, it's, uh, well, we haven't won anything, but I tell you what, <laughs> well, well, um, what I did do is beat you to get a seat in the European Parliament. So what can I say? <laughs> and that was despite, despite Alex Salmon going all over the country trying to get you in. So, you know, I think I did rather well with that. <laughs> My liberal panda. Th thank you. Um, there are, I understand, uh, it's only one panda in the end result, maybe, maybe it's two, but there are four Lib Dem MPs in Scotland. We've, we've quadrupled our number of MPs, <laughs> which is absolutely magnificent. So the claim that we got squeezed by that is not true at all. A great many people in Scotland choose to support the Liberal Democrats because the majority of people in Scotland want to be part of the UK and part of the EU. Well, Thank you. Not entirely, because the other pe person, seat I took, was... Uh, was um, uh, was, was a Liberal Democrat seat. Uh, so <laughs> I'm afraid I took away the last Liberal Democrat seat in the European Parliament for Scotland. So maybe not. <laughs> okay, the Scots need and want jobs. And that cannot be achieved if the Scottish Parliament sets taxes higher than the rest of the United Kingdom. People will not sit about like caper carries to be plucked uh, by a rapacious, incompetent Scottish government with daft and expensive notions about business and expensive, illiberal, authoritarian policies such as the Name Person Act, which even the European Court of Justice found distasteful and authoritarian. And that says something. Oh, may I just finish? I, a, com a, a commissar for every child and every home in Scotland. People are best placed to, to bring up their children not the state, and I don't think we want any more of that. Thank you. It's very gracious to take my point of information, particularly as I'm going to tell him that the named person case uh, hasn't been anywhere near the European Court of Justice. It was the United Kingdom Supreme Court who said that the principle of the scheme was fine, yet procedural aspects required to be tightened up. I'm very happy to correct him on that. I think the European Union has a view on it too, but there you are. They didn't like the look of it. It was illiberal. 
and I think it was described as a liberal and um, authoritarian. But there you are. Um, <laughs> we, we must have been. Uh, they want to hand over the Scottish nationalists our fishing grounds, our oil, our farming, all the regulation of business to the European Union, which will make Scotland even less competitive. In order to make Scotland economically sound and competitive, the Scottish Parliament cannot raise its taxes higher than the rest of the UK. The Scottish Parliament's powers must be limited to ensure that there is no constant clash with Westminster. <coughs> Some competencies have to be run from the British National Parliament of Westminster, such as foreign affairs, defence, finance and business regulation. But they must also not conflict with the competencies in Hollywood. Heretofore, the Nationalists have not been cooperative with the Parliament of Westminster, and they will be punished for this increasingly by the Scottish people at the ballot box. The Scottish Parliament, currently under the SNP, continues to interfere as a market in matters beyond its competence, such as foreign affairs, setting up duplicate embassies around the world. This is expensive to the taxpayer and a necessary waste of hard earned taxpayers' money. Hollywood should not be pontificating about the Middle East or the latest tweet of President Trump, unless, of course, it's about destroying his golf courses, putting useless. German windmills all over his what? in Scotland. <laughs> Tourists come to Scotland to look at mountains, not ugly German bird blenders. <laughs> <laughs> the Parliament should concentrate on infrastructure such as neglected Fourth Bridge and ways of helping Scottish business and not hindering it, such as the recent nonsense of minimal alcohol prices, oh. which will damage our whisky industry and will not stop people getting drunk. As a matter of fact, they'll push them into drugs and methylated spirits. So the whole thing is a dark motion. <laughs> fishing needs to be handled at UK level, according to most of our Scottish fishermen. Fishing is a UK-wide activity. Our fishing grounds should not be returned to the European Union, as the Scottish nationalists want, because otherwise it allows the Spanish and others foreign vessels access to our waters. We want to sell fish to the Spanish for their paella. We don't want them to make a smorgasbord of our fishing grounds in Scotland. <laughs> <That doesn't matter. laughs> uh, point, point, point of information. Is to be useful, it must work in lockstep with Westminster. Otherwise, we would be better off without it. I personally feel that properly run, in the interest of Scotland and her businesses and jobs, the Parliament can be a useful tool in the government of Scotland, airing grievances of hard-working ordinary Scots which may be overlooked in Westminster, and acting in a forum for the Scottish people. If Holyrood is only used by the nationalists as a plaything to achieve an obsession of Scotland becoming a small province of an undemocratic, European, authoritarian superstate, the Parliament will not survive. Scots voted for Scotland to remain in the Union, knowing that there will be a subsequent referendum on the EU by Britain as a whole. We knew that when we voted. The Scottish Nationalists have simply not got over the rejection of separation and Brexit. They simply must abide by the democratic result. Unlike Spain and, Cat the Cat and, Cat and the Catalans, the United Kingdom gave a referendum to Scotland and paid for it. That's how we do things in Britain. But when you have a referendum, you should abide by the democratic result. Otherwise, why bother? This issue is now settled and we have a bright future in front of us, free from the undemocratic and economic sclerotic EU. Britain and Scotland are open for business to the world, buccaneering free trade deals with economically vibrant parts of the world, and not just with over-regulated, uh, over, uh, over uh, financially frail EU with dodgy Italian banks and crippling Orwellian authoritarian bureaucracy. Do we want freedom to rule, be ruled by ourselves, or do we want to be ruled by bureaucrats? That's the question. Thank you. Thank you very much to David for continuing for the proposition. We shall now move back to side opposition.